students, thank you very much for joining me today. My name is Ms. Jodie Lee Broadhurst and I am the lecturer for Natural Science and Technology for the Classroom, NSC 1501. Today we will be going through lesson two in the study guide, which falls under learning unit one, and lesson two is on atoms, molecules, and life. So let's first go through a few of the definitions that are important to know for this section. So the first one is matter. So the word matter in science refers to any physical substance that occupies space and has a mass. So anything around you that you are that you can see is made up of matter. You get different states of matter, which is your solid and your liquid and your gas. And different items can move between these different states of matter. But the word matter refers to any item that occupies space and has a mass. Then when we talk about an atom, now matter that we referred to previously is made up of atoms. So atoms are the building, the basic building blocks of matter. So if you could break apart something that you're looking at, all the little items that it's made up of, building blocks, that would be different little atoms. So an atom is the smallest particle that we are referring to right now. We can have a look inside an atom and at the different particles, which we'll look at soon, and we call those subatomic particles. But an atom is very, very tiny. You can't see it with your naked eye. And then an element is a pure substance made up of one type of atom that cannot be broken down into another sub a substance. So, for example, hydrogen or nitrogen or lead. All of these items are elements because you find them on the periodic table. And I can't take hydrogen or oxygen, for example, and try to break it down into anything that's not oxygen or not hydrogen because it's pure. The atoms are identical. They're exactly hydrogen atoms or oxygen atoms that make up that specific element. And each element is unique to another element. Then when you put elements together in a chemical bond with each other, they make compounds. So a compound is also a pure substance made up of more than one element chemically bonded. And a compound can only be broken down through a chemical reaction. So an example of a compound would be water, carbon dioxide, hydrochloric acid, sodium chloride, all of those that sound very complicated. It's just two elements, three elements bonded together using different chemical bonds. In referring back to an atom that we were talking about. So an atom has little subatomic particles. So if you can imagine an atom like a stadium, the outside of the stadium would be where the spectators sit. So you can imagine on the outside, those little electrons, they are the spectators. And they, each different subatomic particle has a different charge. So an electron has a negative charge. Then in the center, on the field of your stadium or in the nucleus, which is the center of your atom, you get two different subatomic particles that are together. And those are protons and neutrons. Now, protons have a positive charge. They both start with a P, so it's quite easy to remember. So a proton has a positive charge and a neutron has a neutral charge. In other words, no charge. So protons and neutrons are found within the center of an atom in the nucleus. And on the outside of an atom, on the electron shell, we find electrons, which are negatively charged. Then elements are found on the periodic table. Now, in NSC 1501, we don't get too involved with the periodic table and the structure and where things are. However, I do want to refer to a few different things. So firstly, the periodic table was created by a scientist called Dmitry Mendeleev. And the way that these different elements, because these are all elements, are arranged depends on the different characteristics. However, I do want to bring your attention to the fact that 
all the rows going across the periodic table we refer to as periods. And all the columns coming down we refer to as groups. Okay, so on the top left hand side of the periodic table, you would see an H with a one above it and then one comma zero zero seven nine four. So this H refers is the the symbol for hydrogen. So different periodic tables will have different, not very different numbers, but that some periodic tables round off those numbers underneath, or the numbers can be swapped around. If you just look at the numbers. And we're going to talk about it soon. But there's two specific numbers. The one at the top, which basically numbers your elements. And then the ones at the bottom, which can go up quite high. If you look at, um, let's look at iodine. So, or let's go to lead. Okay. So lead, we would find... If you look at the right hand side, if you find carbon at the top and you move down, PB is the symbol for lead. So lead at the top has a number of 82 and at the bottom has a number of 207.2. And these numbers each have different names and they represent something different. Let's have a look. If you look at a number, now in this little image, the numbers are swapped around. The bigger number on the periodic table was actually the smaller number here. So in other words, they, the, what the number was at the top is now at the bottom. So let's just talk about these different numbers. So the atomic number is determined by the number of protons. Remember, we spoke about protons being within the center of an atom in the, uh, in the nucleus. So the atomic number is determined by the number of protons you find in that specific element. Then the atomic mass number, which is often just referred to as the mass number, purely because we, we want to differentiate and we don't want them both to start with atomic. Mass number refers to the number of protons and neutrons. So that's all of the little subatomic particles in the middle, in the nucleus. So that is why it's higher than the atomic number. So it's actually basic math. If you want to know what the number of neutrons of an element is, all you need to do is take the mass number, the bigger number, minus the smaller number, the atomic number, and you'll get the number of neutrons. Why? Because if you take the number of protons and neutrons together and you minus the protons, you're left with just the neutrons. For example, in lithium, the mass number of lithium is seven and the atomic number is three. So three already represents the number of protons. And then the seven rep represents the number of protons and neutrons. So if we take the seven minus the three, we're left with four. So lithium has four neutrons and the three protons, which is shown by the atomic number. Okay, then I want to talk about something called isotopes. So an isotope is an atom of an element that has different number of neutrons. So in other words, it's still the same element, but the number of neutrons within the nucleus is different. For example, you can get different isotopes of hydrogen. So it's still hydrogen, still has the same amount of protons, still the same amount of electrons, but the number of neutrons changes. And neutrons have no charge, they're neutral. So it doesn't change the charge of the element. However, the element can exist in a different state. Generally, if this is asked in a question, you would they would tell you that it would be hydrogen, and then in brackets, they would put a two in Roman numerals. So you know it's the isotope of hydrogen. Okay, um, this was purely put in there so you actually just understand that an isotope, still the same element, um, but different number of neutrons. In a molecule. So a molecule is when we bond different elements together. So the bond is a chemical bond. So a chemical bond is an attraction between atoms that allows the formation of chemical substances that contain two or more atoms. 
So it's a group of atoms together. These atoms do not necessarily have to be different to be a molecule. You can get a molecule of oxygen, which has two atoms of oxygen in it, right? Or you can get a molecule that has different elements in it. So, for example, the atoms of hydrogen and oxygen, when they come together, they make water. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. So that would be a molecule of water. So different molecules, many various molecules of water would have, all of them would have two hydrogens, one oxygen. Okay, so there's an example of a water molecule. Whereas a compound is when two or more elements are joined together through a chemical bond and they become a compound. So a compound is specifically referring to when it is different elements joined together. You can't get a compound of oxygen, for example, because um, oxygen is not bonded to anything else. It hasn't become something different, so it's still an element. However, if you put oxygen with carbon, for example, then it becomes carbon dioxide. Then it is no longer an element, but it becomes a compound. And you can get a molecule of carbon dioxide, a molecule of water, and you can get molecules of oxygen and molecules of nitrogen and lead and all of that. I've given an example here. I said, for example, a water molecule, which is made up of an oxygen element and two hydrogen elements is a compound. We get two different types of compounds. We get organic compounds and inorganic compounds. So an organic compound, they have a carbon element and they usually occur from materials that were once alive where an inorganic compound do not have a carbon element and are not derived from living material. In high school physics, you do a lot of organic chemistry as well, which refers to all the different compounds that you get that have carbon involved. In chemical bonds. So I've put the four most important chemical bonds on here which is a hydrogen bond, a ionic bond. Now, the reason I just put the I there in small letters is not because I made a typo. I know you're supposed to start sentences with capital letters, but it's mainly because I realize a lot of students are interpreting the ionic bond from the study guide as a lonic bond because the capital I looks like a small L. So please notice that it is ionic bond. So we've got a hydrogen bond, an ionic bond, a metallic bond, and a covalent bond. Um, a hydrogen bond is obviously a chemical bond between a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen needs to be involved in a hydrogen bond and an electronegative atom. For example, three molecules of hydrogen bonded to one molecule of nitrogen to form ammonia. So they have a hydrogen bond with each other. Then an ionic bond in yellow highlighted is a bond between a metal and a non-metal. So ionic bonds are results of the attraction between ions. Ions are formed when an atom loses or gains an electron. So remember those electrons are the negatively charged ones on the outer shell of the element. So if we gain or we lose an ele uh, electron, it could determine whether we become positive or negative ions. These types of bonds are commonly formed between a metal and a non-metal. For example, sodium and chlorine. Sodium chloride is formed when we bond sodium and chlorine, and we also call sodium chloride table salt. Well, that's actually what we call it more often than not. We don't sit at the dinner table and say, please pass me the sodium chloride. We say, please pass me the salt. But sodium chloride has a ionic bond between the sodium and the chlorine. Then we get a metallic bond. So a metallic bond is a bond that holds atoms together in a metallic substance. For example, in aluminium foil. Okay, the, the individual little aluminium atoms need to be bonded to each other. And then the covalent bond. So the ionic and the covalent bond are most frequently tested because they are, they are different to each other, actually quite contrasting to each other. So a covalent bond is between two non-metals, and it's the strongest and most common form of chemical bond in living organisms. 
An atom shares one or more pair of electrons with another atom and forms a bond. Such a type of bonding is common between two nonmetals, for example, carbon dioxide. One atom of carbon combines with two atoms of oxygen to form a double covalent bond in carbon dioxide. Okay, ionic versus covalent. Make sure you know this quite well. I enjoy testing it. In mixtures. So we spoke about atoms. We spoke about the subatomic particles that make up atoms. We spoke about elements that are found on the periodic table. We spoke about compounds, which is when there's more than one element joined together with a different bond, and we spoke about the different bonds. We also spoke about molecules, that we get a molecule of water or a molecule of oxygen. Okay, a molecule just refers to when we actually look at them bonded together. A mixture is not a pure substance. So a mixture doesn't necessarily only get studied in science, because it's got nothing really to do with chemical bonds, but often people confuse mixtures when you can't see the individual um, substances that make it up. For example, coffee. Coffee, once you mix everything together, becomes a mixture, not a compound. But when asked the question, it might be easy for you to answer because a lot of people know what the ingredients are that go into coffee. You see the coffee granules, you see the water, the milk, the sugar, however a person takes coffee. Um, but you don't necessarily, when you look at water, just water, which is a compound, not a mixture, you don't look at water and be like, oh, I put hydrogen and oxygen together to make you happen. It just, it, it, that is how water occurs because it's chemically bonded. So, and water, you can't go break water up. I can't go up to a glass of water and try to separate it with my hands into hydrogen and oxygen. Where a mixture is not a pure substance and it can be separated using physical means, like using filter paper to separate a sand and water mixture, like in the image. Um, if there was iron shavings, we could use a magnet to pull that out of any other substance it's in. Yeah, so a mixture can be separated using physical means and not necessarily a chemical reaction to split it again. There's different ways to split compounds, but the two most common ones is a decomposition reaction like you or electrolysis. Okay, not really important in natural sciences, more important when you go into the physical sciences and chemistry. But yes, a compound is pure, a mixture is impure. The compound cannot be separated physically, where a mixture can be separated physically. Make sure you know examples of each. And that's all for our second lesson on atoms and molecules. Thank you very much for joining me and until next time.